Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, first test session from IVF Meeting. Um, this international initiative, which we have called IVF Meeting, is aimed at inviting the IVF community and laboratory scientists to come together to get through this extraordinary time with education and collaboration. My name is Jacques Cohen. Uh, I will be your host the next hour. We may run a little longer. I'm located in upstate New York, in the town of Hudson, not too far from the city of New York. Now one of the hot zones of this terrible pandemic. The coronavirus pandemic has caused an international crisis with a devastating impact on the world and consequently on our profession. While some of us are sick or protecting those who are vulnerable, Many others are furloughed without pay for the foreseeable future. This could take many weeks, maybe months. I believe strongly that you are not going to lose your job and that you will soon go back to relative normalcy, but for now you are probably isolated or many of you are. Our patients are isolated as well and equally upset their demand for treatment will not let up. They will want to be seen by you soon they're not going to go anywhere. Isolation, even temporarily, can be brutal. So Thomas Elliott, Peter Nash, and many others, who you can probably see on the screen right now, have coordinated a global collaborative team to bring embryologists and reproductive scientists around the world in a unique educational program. You are not alone today. As of a few minutes ago, there are 2,484 registrants, registrants for this session. It's incredible. We only started talking to each other 10 days ago. We are also live streaming, in case you're missing this or can't get in, we are live streaming this on Facebook and we'll archive the recording, which we'll be able to access on ivfmeeting.com on the website. We are aiming for both graduate as well as postgraduate education. We are going to apply for CEU credits, maybe in different countries, and this can probably be fast-tracked, or at least we hope it can be. Our initiative is now only 10 days old. As I said, this initiative is not-for-profit, and it's in the first stage of not-for-profit application. We will formalize aspects of our organization as we continue to become comfortable with our objectives. I hope you understand the tentativeness of this initiative while we go through this initial phase. You may have questions about the guidance of ASVM or ASHRAE and other groups or clinics or health authorities. Our position right now about this is that we think we should be neutral or we are neutral. These supported organizations have made recommendations and our initiative may not be the form to dissect those guidelines right now. The session today is centered around the new virus and, um, and, and, and we're calling this a test session. Uh, it may not go as planned. These things are technically complicated, but we certainly will try very hard to make it all work. Our platform is a version of a high-end Zoom subscription. And although I'm not really that religious, as some of you may know, I'm praying for bandwidth for all of you and for bandwidth for Zoom in particular. Our objective, this initiative's objective is to create a, a schedule of lectures, roundtable discussions, interviews, tutorials, and other virtual activities. These meetings will be held on a regular basis. We are starting with two sessions a week. Next week, also two sessions, but we may upgrade that to more. And at some point, we may well be live every day, but that all depends not just on us, but also on you and possibly the organizations that we represent. This is a global initiative. There are already about nine or so organizations listed here um, that are, uh, have shown considerable interest in using this format to present their own meetings. So this is a portal, a technical portal to help them out and we will help them visit. And we, as you saw before, 
uh, we showed you before is a lot of people. We're about 30 coordinators already, all within one week. And we're looking out to you to help us with this process because it's actually pretty complicated. Now, before I introduce you to our wonderful speakers of today, Kay Elder from the UK and Lodo Parmigiani from Italy, um, uh, I would, uh, I would uh, um, like to emphasize that if you're just calling in or, or, or listening to audio or seeing everything, uh, that this is indeed ivfmeeting.com and this is our first test session and hopefully everything will, will go uh, as we want it to go. So, with me today are two speakers who are infection specialists and have a special interest, of course, in this virus, particularly because they're both in such an incredible situation that they are um, affected by this virus probably more than the average. Kay Elder is in, in the UK in her, um, in her apartment um, and in her rooms. And uh, she's been told by the government there that she has to stay there for 12 months, oh, sorry, for 12 weeks, <laughs> for 12 weeks. If I was to live in the UK because of my age, it would be about 10 or 11 weeks in my case. Lodo is even a more amazing story because Lodo is a survivor of the virus. He is still in isolation, but coming out of it either today or tomorrow or anytime soon. Um, he was able to stay at home, was ill 11 days, very ill. And we can ask him more about that later. Lodo will, will be happy to answer your questions and volunteer information. It's great to have both of you with us. Uh, um, uh, um, and, and I think uh, we start with Kay first. Kay Elder, as you probably all know, Kay has been in this field since the early 1980s. I worked with her in Bornhall Clinic, so we go back a long time. Uh, and before, before I introduce, before I let her share her screen, just the last slide, I wanna show you this last slide. I think we have a slide of our proceedings. Yes, there it is. Um, we actually did worldwide conferences and particularly Thomas Elliott, who is the main director of this initiative. Uh, he's the technical, technical chief. Uh, he and Kay Elder, sponsored by Alpha Scientists in Reproductive Medicine, held virtual conferences, the first ones ever in our field, and maybe the first ones ever in medicine uh, from 1997 to 2000. And, and a lot of those subjects were published in proceedings that, that Kay, uh, Kay and, uh, uh, and Thomas uh, uh, published. Um, um, and I, I, I guess some of those are, may still be available and they should now have a very, very high value. But the amazing thing, if you look at those titles, is that a lot of those are relevant. Blastis Culture, Blastis is Update, Problem Solving and Troubleshooting in IVF. Oh, we still do that. Safe cryopreservation, safe cryopreservation. And, and then there are all these cryo storage issues that come up. Micromanipulation, guidelines and accreditation. So the subjects haven't really changed that much over the years, but I, I wanted to show that because we have a little bit of experience doing this um, more than 20 years ago. So okay, if you're, if you're there, I can't see you right now, but if you're there, um, It'd be, a, it'd be a pleasure if you uh, can share your screen. And there you are in Cambridge. How are you feeling, there, Kay? You okay? Yes, I'm very well, thanks. Oh, great. Okay, well, we're looking forward to, your, to the information you're going to provide. I mean, you're going to introduce us, us with um, the story on viruses. We're completely intrigued with the subject right now. Everybody is. Uh, but you're a virologist in a previous life. You're an MD, a virologist, a clinical embryologist, a clinical scientist, an author. Um, well, there's a lot more to you. So, <laughs> grandmother. <laughs> and a grandmother. Well, there you go. Well, that's why you're in confinement. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, yeah, please, we're looking forward to it. Okay. It's gone to the second slide for some reason.
Yeah, take your time. I'll get there. I'll get there. Okay. okay. I'm Right, well, good afternoon from the sunny afternoon in the UK. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak to you about this very, very important subject that has become such a nightmare to so many people all over the world. I would like to start with this uh, phrase at the bottom, first to learn the nature of things. We I suggest that we can't really understand how to deal with problems like this unless we first understand what it's about and how viruses operate. So let's start with defining what is a virus. Well, I think it's a fiendishly cunning, very, very tiny entity that causes disease and also mutates and evolves continuously. We could regard them as molecular pirates or wizards. They're mobile genetic units. They deliver their genome into a host cell and let the host cell do all the work of replicating and expressing the virus. They've been around for billions of years. They don't affect only uh, humans. They affect fungi, parasites, bacteria, animals, and of course humans. But then through the, the tricks and the wizardry that they have, they can co-evolve with their host cells. They can rearrange their genes, mutate, recombine. So anytime a host cell attacks them with an immune attack, or if they want to cross into another species, they very conveniently rearrange their genetic material to allow them to do that. Their genomes are nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, but never both. And there are seven different classes of this nucleic acid combination. If it's DNA, it can be double or single stranded, linear or circular. If it's RNA, it can be positive or negative sense. And either DNA or RNA can be single, multiple, segmented or non-segmented. So there's a huge variety in types of viruses. They have no properties of normal cells. They have no membranes, no ribosomes, no enzymes. They can't make ATP. So they are obligate intracellular parasites. They depend completely on their host cell metabolism and their synthesizing systems. They don't respire, move, grow, produce waste products, use energy or respond to any stimuli. They were previously classified on the basis of morphology, host range, etc. But now, of course, we use whole genome sequencing and bioinformatics to build and compare family trees. They have a very neat structure. The nucleic acid genome, as I said, DNA or RNA is enclosed in a capsid, which is made of very specialized structural proteins. They create a symmetrical and stable enclosure that protects the nucleic acid. They can be uh, icosahedral or helical or very complex. Um, one of the special properties is that they have is that they're very stable when they're uh, shielding the virus outside the host cell. And as soon as it enters the host cell, it's able to dissociate and release the genome to start pirating the host cell. It recognizes the new viral nucleic acids as they're made and protects them from being degraded. And then it also interacts with the host cell as the virus leaves the cell to form an envelope. The nucleocapsid is, called, is the nucleic acid with its enclosed capsid. The envelope is always derived from the host cell membrane. The virus can't make it itself and it gathers it as it leaves the cell. It has very specific properties and very important properties. It has virus specific proteins that determine which host they are able to infect. These outer spikes, they're called peplomeres, bind to receptors on host cells and they're capable of inducing a neutralizing antibody immune response in the host. Stripping off the envelope will destroy the infectivity. And that's why there's so much emphasis on hand washing and sanitizer these days. Lipid solvents and detergents dissolve the outer envelope and then the virus 
is not no longer infectious. When they start their cycle of replication, they attach to specific receptors on the whole cell membrane and enter. Other surface receptors might also be required. Cells that do not have this receptor cannot be infected. Now, different viruses use different receptors for different cells. The same virus can use different receptors for different cells, but it's a very specific interaction and a very important interaction. Once they enter the cell, the, the capsid dissociates, releasing the nucleic acid, which then moves into the nucleus to start replicating its um, nucleic acid and also making messenger RNA, which will travel to the ribosomes and start making virus-specific proteins, which, which then create the capsid and any other molecules that the virus needs to take with it protects the RNA and then buds out of the envelope carrying virus specific proteins. They pack very, very light. They only take whatever they need in order to enter and hijack another cell. Everything else is dependent on all the biosynthetic machinery and apparatus of the host cell. Some viruses, of course, can, uh, they're very clever. They can come into the cell and decide not to replicate. They'll lay, stay dormant, waiting for better conditions, such as immune suppression, when they can be reactivated and start their replication cycle. Diagnosis nowadays, of course, is with uh, nucleic acid technology to identify the genome using an appropriate sample or specimen, and also serology looking for specific antibodies in convalescent sera, acute and convalescent sera. Just a little bit about viral receptors, because these are very, very important in the, the course of viral infection. Not all viruses have envelopes, but those that do enter the host cell, as I've already said, by attaching and binding their specific glycoprotein to a surface protein on the host cell. This induces a conformational change that lets the virus fuse its membrane with the host cell membrane, and then the virus can enter, start targeting intracellular organelles and uncoating its genome. Uh, this interaction with the receptor can also induce sig signal transduction in the host cell. You can get uh, cytokine secretion, apoptosis, and stimulation of the immune response, or even immunosuppression. Some viruses have even adapted to stop the apoptotic cascade in the cells that they infect, so that the cells don't uh, destroy themselves before the virus can replicate. This interaction dis will determine which cell the virus can infect and the host range. It usually constitutes an interspecies barrier, but we know, of course, to our sorrow, that this doesn't, can be broken because mutations in the viral surface membrane proteins can drastically change the tropism and virulism. The cell receptor molecules on the target cells are usually glycoprotein or glycolipid and always molecules that are essential to cellular function, such as heparin sulfate, sialic acid, etc. Now, the, uh, the virus that we're all concerned about at the moment has decided to use a very important key regulator in the renin-angiotensin system as its receptor, angiotensin-converting enzyme 2. This interaction between vir virus and receptors are very important targets when we're thinking about developing vaccines and in therapeutic intervention. Viruses that are relevant to IVF. We're, we're all very familiar with these that are listed here, the ones that uh, infect the genitor urinary tract, like herpes simplex, papillomaviruses, CMV that can cause congenital disease, the bloodborne viruses, which are very potent pathogens, Hep B, Hep C, and the retroviruses. I'm not going to dwell on this because we're all very familiar with them. We've been living with them for many years in IVF. A new virus emerged 
in 2015. It was first recognized in 1947, but it became of concern to uh, IVF in 2015 when it was realized that uh, if a woman was infected in early pregnancy, it could cause microcephaly in the baby. And so it has now been, become of serious concern. It does this by uh, crossing the placenta. It infects placental trophoblast cells and affects neuroprogenital cells in the embryonic brain. And in fact, Sertoli cells are a known reservoir for the Zika virus. But let's move on to what you're all waiting to hear about, the uh, novel virus that causes the disease that's known as COVID-19. Um, it was identified by genome sequencing to be related to the SARS virus that emerged in 2002, and both are related to a bat virus. Both cross the species barriers from an animal reservoir, and they both have positive sense RNA. The spike proteins on their surface are three-pronged, they're trimeric, and they are the molecules that mediate attachment and fusion to the cell. The spikes are very similar in both viruses. They're 77.5% identical in their amino acid sequence. And as I said before, they bind this very important enzyme as the host receptor. This enzyme is strongly expressed in the human body, in the GI system, heart, kidney, and in type two alveolar cells in the lungs, at least, and probably other systems as well. But the, these, uh, the renin angiotensin system is very important in regulating uh, vasoconstriction and uh, diseases associated with hypertension. The spike has two functional subunits, S1 and S2. I'm telling you this just to illustrate how very, very clever viruses can be in their evolution and mutation. Uh, the receptor interaction is on S1, and that triggers conformational changes that enables fusion. In S S2 enables the fusion of the membranes. Now, neutralizing antibodies usually target receptor binding subdomains. So the protein sequence between the receptor binding subdomain in these two viruses has been changed between SARS and the, the, the new variant. There's only 46% identity in amino acid sequence. So therefore, any antibodies that someone may have developed to the first virus will not attack this new virus. In fact, no cases of the initial SARS virus have been reported since 2004. That virus was eradicated by intensive contact tracing and case isolation. This is the way it replicates. It's basically exactly the same scheme that I showed you in a previous slide. So how are we going to protect ourselves? Biosafety in the IVF lab. Well, we have a very particular situation in IVF, as you all know, because infection and contamination can be acquired and transmitted to and from multiple sources. Um, this is not just a theoretical idea because we know that it has happened with the retroviruses and with hepatitis B and C. What do we do about it? Well, hazard containment. Viruses are unlikely to replicate under IVF tissue culture, culture conditions. As I've mentioned before, they need a receptor. So unless somehow a virus has found a receptor on an embryo or an egg or sp sperm, it's not going to be able to enter those cells and replicate. However, they can be transmitted via treatment procedures. So any body fluids from infected patients or staff, uh, semen, follicular fluid, vaginal fluids, blood, and in, from in the case of respir respiratory viruses, viruses, aerosols from coughs or sneezes. What we have to do is establish safe methods to reduce or eliminate exposure to any hazardous agents. 
and a common high standard of handling has to be applied in all contact in the IVF lab. Regular cleaning and decontamination is absolutely crucial. Fortunately, cleaning agents have been developed for IVF labs. So I just want to uh, remind you that the SARS COVID-19 has been found to be detectable in aerosols for up to three hours, up to four hours on copy, copper, up to 24 hours on cardboard, and up to two to three days on plastic and stainless steel. And of course, hepatitis B is known to be stable in dried blood for up to four months. So regular cleaning and decontamination schedules are absolutely crucial in the IVF lab. Of course, when you're thinking about risk assessment, you should consider geography and epidemiology. And uh, these maps are available from the CDC and WHO so that different parts of the world can make their own decisions. I'm not going to read the uh, fundamental biosafety precautions because they should be very familiar to all of you. They're published everywhere in everyone's guidelines and in several books. But the bottom line is really that all human tissue should be considered as potentially infectious. And we have to be scrupulous in all aspects of clinically and laboratory work. And a stringent infection control policy is absolutely mandatory in every ART unit. In other words, we need to learn and understand all of the risks and hazards, use the information that we learn, and also use common sense to avoid the risks and contain the hazards. So good luck to everyone. Stay well and stay safe. Thank you. Uh, apologies here, I had an alarm going off and you probably could hear a little bit of that. No idea where it's coming from, but it stopped. I hope it will keep, uh, keep silent. Okay, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, there are a, a few quick questions while Lodo is maybe uh, uh, can load up his uh, uh, his presentation and share share his uh, desktop. Uh, one question that came up was how stable in white light uh, are viruses uh, or sunlight? Um, you know we have most labs have white light. Um, I would think they probably don't like that, but maybe there is no effect. They don't. That's what I've been. <laughs> that's what I've been telling everyone here. We should be out in the fresh air and the sunshine, not not indoors. The viruses do not like sunshine. UV destroys their nucleic acid. Yeah. No. Is, is, that, is that why the effects of, of for instance, the flu are, are considerably less in summers in the Northern Hemisphere? That's probably one of the reasons. But they, the virus, most viruses, especially respiratory viruses, they like, they like humid, damp atmospheres. They like this, the sort of uh, environment that you find inside the respiratory tract, obviously, damp and humid. Um, they don't like UV light. Okay. And uh, would you have any suggestions for adjustments of the humidity in laboratories? Because what you just said, take yeah. it down a little? No? You have to use your common sense. We don't know, basically. You don't know, no. Uh, you don't know humidity because you'll encourage fungi as well. Okay. So, and, 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 and of course, we can use UV when we're not there. Um, um, and, uh, and, 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 yeah. In the, in the flow hoods, yes. Yeah, in the flow hoods, that's right. Um, and, and, and I think we have. I mean, do you know, um, have you ever heard of a potential problem with, with viruses in IVF, in the lab? I mean, of course, there, there could be problems with the, with the patients and donors, but, but in the actual culture, have you ever, is there any paper? I couldn't find anything. I'm not aware of any. I mean, it would be highly unlikely. I mean, it doesn't mean it can't happen in the future, but it would be extremely unlikely, especially as I think um, Kim has pointed out, um, in the in animal breeding systems, they they routinely have to be careful to decontaminate their semen samples and viruses um, um, and uh, embryos, which are going to be shipped by uh, frozen and they uh, 
they use um, for washing. Okay. Uh, okay. What kind of dilution you make when you wash? But you, you certainly you should you should be able to wash all traces of any virus particles that may have been hanging around if you do it carefully and thoroughly. Yeah. Right. Great. Thanks. We'll get back to you again, and uh, because I'm sure there will be other questions after after Lodo's uh, talk, and and uh, and I will then at that point also ask the panelists if they have anything to add or or, or, or have more questions. So Lodo, uh, we are looking at okay. us, and if you could share it, there you are. So Lodo, yeah. how was that terrible experience? Tell, give give us a, a a minute breakdown of your experience with the virus yourself. And, and I, you know that the experience was that today today I, I received the, the visit of of the, the paramedics to do the the COVID nineteen test. Finally, I hope that uh, it will be negative. Uh, the problem was that uh, in the bar that I have in front of my clinic, there were some spreaders, uh, and uh, this was a, a bar for you know the tank and where old people go to play billiards. And that's it. I went for a sandwich uh, for a couple for two days. It was at the beginning of March, and uh, probably I went in contact with virus. In that moment, and then from uh, Monday nine in the evening, I uh, start to have fever, and I had fever for eleven days, uh, and then difficulties for breathing, uh, uh, diarrhea, <laughs> and uh, I was very very tired for eleven days. Uh, the fever was fluctuating from thirty seven. To 39 degrees Celsius. Um, yeah. Uh, only the, the, the last days, cough. Um, um, yes. Uh, now I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. The last day of fever was uh, Friday, the, the 2020, so March. March. So right. I'm okay now. So, uh, I was lucky. I was lucky. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, and thank you for sharing that because it takes something yeah. to share that information. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, you look great. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, maybe lost some weight. Um, but you, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm eating a, a lot, you know. So yeah. here in Italy. <laughs> and not moving much right now. Okay. Well, yeah. I hope your test will be negative, and you can go out um, and, and and go uh, walk around. Um, so, yeah. so. Well, we're looking forward to your presentation to add to. Yeah. What Kay has said, and you're going to focus, of course, on uh, on what happens in liquid nitrogen. Is that a potential issue? Because yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, yeah, yeah. So I, I think Kay did the perfect introduction for my presentation. Uh, many people know that uh, I'm very into this topic, so potential contamination in liquid nitrogen. First of all, I would like to thank you, uh, Peter, Naji, and Thomas. Uh, everybody did. Uh, this webinar possible because it's incredible. I ch I've checked uh, the participants and it, it seems that all the IVF wor world is now connected. So this is incredible. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. So le let's go ahead. Um, so liquid nitrogen is a key cryogenic agent in cooling and freezing and is used for, you know, in food beverage, for uh, food manufacturing uh, uh, in uh, food packaging and uh, um, deep freezing uh, in bottling and it is used uh, as well in uh, drug manufacture, uh, manufacturing cosmetics and of course in healthcare in uh, the hospitals uh, for cryosurgery um, um, uh, dermatologists use liquid nitrogen and of course we use it in a uh, in a, a system of reproduction for cryopreservation, preservation, biobanking, vitrification, and warming. Uh, liquid nitrogen can be contaminated because uh, uh, Kay showed to us that viruses are uh, very simple um, um, uh, contaminants. Uh, they are uh, free of water, so they can be uh, they can vitrify, they can be cryopreserved accidentally very easily 
in contact with liquid nitrogen. Uh, in cell cryobanks, uh, we found uh, viruses, bacteria, fungi. Um, uh, so contamination creates risks for cells, of course, biological samples, patients, and also food quality. Uh, uh, so many applications potentially require um, sterile liquid nitrogen before the use, because we know the manufacturer can guarantee about the quality of liquid nitrogen that, uh, that they are manufacturing, but that it, then it's impossible to uh, guarantee all the transportation because we know that we cannot uh, close the liquid nitrogen because the re-expansion is 700 times uh, from liquid to gas. Uh, so uh, potentially uh, uh, many sector will benefit, sectors will benefit to uh, a certification of sterilization of liquid nitrogen before use. And this of course is in human reproduction during vitrification, cryo storage, and very, very important in my opinion, uh, during warming, uh, we have to keep in mind that the waste of money due to contamination in assisted reproduction, uh, it has been estimated around 100 million per year dollars, okay? So in US, uh, it has been estimated around $7 million per year. And also, if we keep in mind that, uh, that for, you know, for food production, uh, we have 1 million deaths per year for food contamination or environment contamination. We can understand uh, that maybe uh, after the, the, this uh, uh, you know, pandemic, uh, uh, maybe we, we will be more sensitive about the potential contamination of liquid nitrogen. So uh, contamination of samples may occur during uh, the uh, cryo storage of cells in liquid nitrogen and also nitrogen vapors. Also in the new tank, uh, uh, they, 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 they had liquid nitrogen in the, you know, in the walls and they, they, they are declaring that they have only air. So they have low temperature and this low temperature, uh, cell tissue are frozen and as well as the contaminants. Uh, the potential sources of contamination are other crops uh, samples stored in the same cryotank. We have information uh, in the 90s, uh, it was published on, the, on Lancet that uh, six patients became infected uh, uh, by hepatitis B uh, because they received uh, uh, some cell from bone marrow that were stored uh, in an infected tank. And then, of course, uh, uh, liquid nitrogen and nitrogen vapors themselves can, uh, can, can, can be a source of, of contamination because due to it, the exposure of cryotanks to the laboratory environment during refilling and also during the handling of the specimens that you do, we do every day, ice crystal will form on the walls of the vessels. So aggregated uh, ice and sediment and trapped viruses bacteria, uh, fungi, okay? So uh, this is already uh, known uh, so, uh, that airborne contaminants come in contact with liquid nitrogen, nitrogen vapors, and remain crops. Uh, this is known also uh, in food manufacturing, food and beverage. It, there is already a sector called ster sterile packaging, sterile bottling in which the manufacturer carry out a, a raw filtration of liquid nitrogen. This is because uh, they already perceive that the liquid nitrogen can be a source of contamination. Of course, this raw filtration cannot be a guarantee of sterility, cannot be effective against smaller microorganisms, such as small bacteria, viruses, prions, for example. Uh, what about coronaviruses and COVID-19? Uh, in this COVID-19 pandemic, manufacturers of drug disposables, culture media, um, you know, reassuring us. Uh, I think you already received the email from uh, our supplier. Uh, they say they are trying to mitigate the risk uh, by sourcing raw materials to low risk regions. Now it's impossible, but of course, this is not applicable to liquid nitrogen and nitrogen vapor. So these become potential vectors of contamination. Um, 
aerosol and surface stability of COVID-19 has been investigated and uh, before Kay told us uh, that the persistence of this virus, uh, but the risk of this virus being accidentally crops of the liquid nitrogen, nitrogen vapor has not been studied. So, coronaviruses, as well as other viruses, uh, can be crop to serve the liquid nitrogen and nitrogen vapor. Uh, so, the use of contaminated liquid nitrogen and nitrogen vapor risks virus awakening and the contamination of uh, towing cells, environment, and operators. So, there is no more a problem, and we will see this about open carriers, closed carriers, semi closed carriers. The problem is liquid nitrogen can infect operators, so we, we need to be protected, and the environment. So we have information about some uh, clinics in Europe that closed for the, uh, because one of the operators had the COVID-19. So they are declaring that they, they will sanitize the laboratory. Uh, they should think also to sanitize the liquid nitrogen there, they get samples inside the tanks. So, we know that ASRM, ASHRAE, and also other uh, societies uh, uh, gave us recommendation to safeguard health and safety of patients and staff. So what they suggested, they suggest a cancellation of all fresh embryo transfer. Why? Because they are worried about potential uh, infection of the patient. So they are suggesting to freeze the oocyte in the embryo for later embryo transfer. And so what? So uh, we need to keep in mind that potentially in two or three months we will have the same problems because the liquid nitrogen can be potentially contaminated in this situation. So uh, we, everybody, we know that cell vitrification now is performed with different type of carriers. For many years we discussed about open carriers, closed carrier. Now we solve the problem because uh, we have in the market open carriers that are marketed as closed carriers, okay? I don't want to discuss the sex of angels, so as we say in Italy, but I think you are informed that uh, you are using some closed carriers, I don't want to say that the names, because we, everybody we know the names, that are marketed as closed carriers, but we are using as open carriers. Anyway, we know that open carriers have a high efficiency with all sites, and we know that there is potential risk of contamination uh, uh, if uh, contaminants uh, go in contact, contact with the other surface of the carriers uh, if the liquid nitrogen is accidentally contaminated. Um, the different systems, so we know well the open system and I already uh, said my consideration about the, the open system now in the market. And then we had the straw and straw closed system. We saw in the past also the single straw closed system. And then we have also a system in which the vitrification occurs in nitrogen vapors, uh, we, which we can call it super cool air, but it's nitrogen vapors. And then we have a system in which we have a, a, a solid surface vitrification. Then we have automatic vitrification, which basically we use closed system. As I told you before, uh, if we consider the potential risk of infection, so the problem is not anymore open or closed system. This was the uh, potential model uh, of hy hypothetical contamination that uh, I proposed 10 years ago. So the idea is that we have the uh, uh, frozen microorganism in liquid nitrogen, because in liquid nitrogen, this, this microorganism can go in contact with the other surface of the carriers in liquid nitrogen. Uh, and then when we plunge the carrier in the culture medium at 37 degree, this might reactivate. So you can understand that this reactivation is just for the one minute that we are at 37 degrees in the um, first warming solution. And then we are diluting the risk of this contamination because we uh, pick up this all site embryo uh, will bring the, the, the cell to the second well uh, with 0.5 or more uh, extracellular cryoprotectant, uh, diluting in this way the risk of contamination. And then again, we um, move this cell to the 
two step of washing uh, with large volume. That's uh, the reason why we are always suggesting large volume in order to you know, dilute again the potential risk of contamination. Then we're putting in a uh, culture medium in which we have antibiotics. So for uh, some, uh, uh, some kind of microorganism, this can be effective. So the potential risk, I agree with you, uh, is low. And this is what we have considered for the last 10 years. But, so as I told you, uh, uh, it's not a problem of closed and open system. Uh, accidental contamination uh, through liquid nitrogen may occur during storage and handling uh, um, in, in any step. So the fact that the infection traceable to cryo storage have not been reported after millions of embryo transfer is surely to the reduced title title of contamination in the liquid nitrogen. Uh, and then I can agree with uh, Kim Pomeroy that said 10 years ago that at that time was negligible. But we have to keep in mind that the potential of, of, of infection is real. Look now, now we are all locked down in our house. We, we never thought about the, uh, this situation. So we have to, to think about, uh, you know, uh, an accidental high tartar or contaminants in our cryo tank, a sabotage, I don't know, or highly infective agent. So uh, we know that it's possible. K uh, said before the uh, ultraviolet radiation is very effective to kill any kind of virus. For example, for hepatitis or coronavirus, we need just 8,000 UV dose. That means in just two, three minutes, we are able to deactivate these kind of viruses. Um, so we can decontaminate small quantity of liquid nitrogen to perform our vitrification. And this is very, very important to perform a safe washing before uh, the warming procedure. So, uh, we need to keep in mind that we do a lot of manipulation in our uh, clinics. You know, I'm director of a, a big group now that ha ha we had two uh, oversight bank uh, uh, and one sperm bank in our group in Spain. Uh, they are shipping uh, oversight and sperm uh, all around Europe and also uh, in other countries. So if we consider that we do a lot of handling, we are exposing the carriers uh, uh, to many, many risks uh, of contamination. We perform the vitrification on the polystyrene box with liquid nitrogen. So this is the first step in which potentially we can contaminate the carriers. And then we put uh, after vitrification in a tempor for temporary storage in a cryo tank. And then we take out this, uh, we check the labels and uh, the, the um, to, to, to split the, the carriers, uh, we put in uh, dry shippers uh, to ship this uh, all site to other countries. Then we expose this dry shipper or the, 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 the tanks with, which are filled with liquid nitrogen uh, to the, the courier the personnel that uh, is doing the, the transportation. Then these uh, uh, carriers you know, when you receive a parcel here in Italy now with uh, uh, with the uh, UPS, the DHL, you know, the, the, the couriers say, oh, I give you this parcel, uh, stay, keep, keep your distance. So let's imagine that we have vapors, nitrogen vapors. So let's imagine that we have uh, liquid nitrogen inside that, that can crap any virus. So then we receive the dry shipper, uh, we take out the oil site, uh, we put the oocyte in a uh, um, uh, polystyrene box to check the, the, the label, to, to, to check the name, and then we put it uh, in a cryo tank for temporary storage. Again, at the day of warming, we take out this, we put in uh, oocyte, we put in a polystyrene box with other liquid nitrogen, and again, this oh, is no. another handling, another oh. risk of contamination. No, no, we, uh, we have about 100 questions for you already. And we won't get them to all of them today and i'll, I'll, I'll want to let everybody know we're going to put all those questions on the web and we'll uh -huh. try to get as well as, as as we can we'll try to answer most of these okay questions. okay just wanted to say that but if you could wrap it up it'll be great so we get to some of those crucial questions 
that'd be that'd be nice if you could could uh... okay 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 let's see i finished the presentation then we check together the the the, the, the question okay i i, I finished my presentation I this i think this is the crucial point okay so we know that multiple washing is affecting in decreasing uh, the infection uh, rendering all sites and embryos free from viral and bacterial pathogens so uh, i showed before that during warming we uh, uh, normally do this dilution uh, what we can do we can also uh, clean the cardiac before washing of course we can do this for uh, sperm straw because we can clean it with alcohol so, or, or the cryo ice. we cannot do this for uh, uh, vitrification carrier. So what we have to do, the solution is to clean it with fresh and possibly certified sterile liquid nitrogen. Uh, we did this and we demonstrated this uh, eight years ago. Uh, what we did, we contaminated with a very high titer of contaminants, the liquid nitrogen. We plunged the, uh, many, many carriers, any kind of carriers in liquid nitrogen. And what we found that half of this, we we pick it up these the, the, the carriers and we check the uh, microbiologically and we said that hundred percent were contaminated. Half of these were washed through like washed with a good amount of liquid nitrogen to detach potential contaminants. And then we checked for microbiology and we uh, uh, we realized that uh, all these carriers were clean. So the certification of the sterile liquid nitrogen batch used for the washing procedure can be a reliable trace for any standard operational procedures, any quality assurance book, and then uh, can be used also in case of strict regulation. You know, for example, in, that in Europe, in some countries, uh, the suggestion is, that is to use open carriers, not closed carriers. But as I said before, this is not anymore the problem. It's not closed or open carrier. Then. Finally, we need to demonstrate that we are doing our dual cleaning periodically. We need to register this. This is complicated because uh, uh, we need to remove the samples and then we need to clean it. Uh, so again, if we think uh, uh, these laboratories that were closed for uh, quarantine, they are thinking to clean, to sanitize the walls, the, the, uh, the, the tops, and then they should think also to demonstrate that uh, they, they, they have sanitized the, 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 the containers. So my plea is not, not underestimate the potential risk of liquid nitrogen, nitrogen vapors mediated COVID-19 infection, as well as all the other infection as uh, I said for many, many years, I will say that I'm a, I was a Cassandra, you know, like the mythologic, uh, 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 figure uh, ca character, but this is the real problem. So we need to put in place strategies to prevent this eventuality, and uh, so we need procedures to minimize contamination during vitrification, warming, handling of the cells, and cryo storage. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, that, that's that's uh, that's great, Lodo. Um, and uh, I mean, so many questions, so many questions that you raised and issues and, and so many questions that are coming from the part participants. There was a lot of people, famous, famous guys, yeah. all sorts of questions. We're, we're not going to come to it all, but, but here are some questions. Um, Diego Escura, size nanofiltration. <laughs> can, you, can you filter, yeah, can you filter um, um, the media to remove uh, viruses? A uh, quick, quick answer to that. In, in animals, he says, well, you can do a tips in the wash. Uh, and then he also has a question later on, do endometrial cells have the receptor? Because we, the question that has been asked several times uh, in, in the Q&A is, um, do gametes and embryos have receptors? Have have receptors can, can, can load them? Any, any, do they have receptors? Can they attach to sperm, eggs, and embryos? Well, there's no reason for eggs or embryos or sperm to have uh, an angiotensin converting enzyme which is used in the body in the renin angiotensin system there is no biological reason for those cells to have that receptor and also remember that the, the eggs and embryos are surrounded by a zona pellucida so it's even more unlikely that they're going to have an ace2 receptor 
Yeah. Of course, the zone of yeah. pollution has enormous pores in it, and viruses will go well, will go right through it. And I, 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 I agree that they were probably not not attached to the that why would they attach to the to to the to the embryo and the oocyte and 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 perhaps also sperm to well, sperm to the particularly, mm -hmm. uh, but of course the risk is different here. There are two risks. Are they going to or, or three? If you go with Diego's comment, uh, are they going to um, um, attach to gametes and embryos? Or are you just transferring them because you're moving fluids around? Well, that, the, 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 the main risk is for transferring. If you, if you have yeah. a source of contamination, then the main risk in the IVF lab is that you can contaminate other, not only people around you, but the patients as well. So that's the main risk. Okay. I, yeah. Yeah. But of course, our system is a dilution system. Yes. Right? Yeah. So we wash and wash and wash and move and move and move. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, so the main point of my lecture is that really you have to do everything you can to prevent having any infection in your lab. That's okay. the so, so uh, Dr. Brian Levine from New York uh, asked the question well, this virus has been around in, in, in our environment for probably weeks and months, so we have been treating patients not knowing that there was an infection already, and now you probably have it in the system, in the culture system, and frozen embryos. So so actually, that brings it to to Lodo, which is you could have this now frozen yeah. in doers and yeah. Uh, yeah. What, so, what? yeah, this is a potential risk because I think that nobody, maybe before my presentation, was thinking that uh, uh, we need also to you know to 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 to, to set up measure to demonstrate that we are doing uh, our you know best to also consider the potential contamination in liquid nitrogen because maybe we can uh, think about cleaning the surfaces, the tops, uh, uh, continue to work with uh, our protection. We should be able to say, okay, I'm doing my best. I'm taking out uh, uh, the, the cell from the um, tank. Uh, uh, I'm considering this, the, the, this cell potentially contaminated, so I will do my washing, I will do my dilution. Yeah. So yeah. in this way, we, 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 we are in the safe side, you know. Yeah, because... well, we, we really haven't experienced viral infections. There are plenty of other bad viruses, and we really haven't experienced that from, from infection of the gametes and embryos. And, and Anna Vega, who uh, was it's great, she's in the room. I mean, she's She's saying you are assuming that viral contamination can come from different sources. But in any case, after the manipulation is performed during IVF, the viral load in the culture medium and the stored straws will be very, very low and mostly non effective, or not, mostly not effective if effective at all. And I, I, I think that is a good point. And we can do some further research on that, or other people will, will do, uh, others will do research on that, hopefully, and, and probably started this process already. So what do you think about trips and wash? I think that's a little far, right? Going a little far for, for, for uh, our work compared to that. But the animal, animals, Diego is pointing out, that's what they do. He's also saying, well, what about the endometrial cells receptors? It's likely that they will have receptors, okay? Would they? Would they have receptors? I can't imagine why they would, because you know the renin angiotensin system is 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 related. It's well, very very important in the kidneys and controlling hypertension. Um, it's involved in vasoconstriction. I mean, it, oh, the, the short answer is I don't know, but I can't imagine why any reason why uterine cells would need a renin angiotensin system. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah, Kim, you have a couple of points and questions to answer. Go, go ahead, Kim. Yeah, I just wanted to say, we, this issue has been around ever since the beginning. Everything we have is contaminated by viruses and bacteria and fungi. There's, we don't work in a sterile system, uh, and it will be almost impossible to do that. Despite that, um, we haven't seen any instances of tissue contamination, cross-contamination, or to a patient. And this includes some diseases that are rampant in, for example, livestock, uh, where all we have as a treatment is to dilution. So dilution is the solution. One virus is not going to cause you to become all of a sudden infected. As Kay said, you must have the receptor or you must have enough virus available to 
overcome the body's natural methods of protections. The other thing is trying to purify out viruses is a very difficult procedure through filtration. And we have to realize that much of the things that we purchase, if they're not gamma irradiated, they probably already have viruses in them. The filters that are used are at 0.2 microns. Yeah. Most viruses will get through that. So right. this is something that has been ongoing for a long time. And I would expect you to find HIV viruses um, in some of the things that we use even now. Yeah, well, very good point. Well, th thank you for your comments. I, I think we have a lot of questions. We are now one hour into this session. As I said before, we're going to have all these questions listed. If there's any panelists right now, Pavlo Meza, you're a virologist and an embryologist. If you have anything to say right now, please, please do. If any of you panelists have any, any other comments, uh, please do. And, 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 and I'm really sorry that all these famous people in the audience, we're not getting to all of their questions right now, but we're going to list those. And it's my suggestion, and if, I hope the panelists agree with this, that we do a white paper on this immediately and that we put all those questions in line. Lodo, if you could help, Kay, if you could help, yeah. and that by the next weekend, we basically have a paper that states, yeah. well, these are the issues, and we do not think, or we do think, that there may be some areas of improvement, and there may be some areas of taking care, and as Kay has already pointed out. We're doing much of that already, uh, and, and, and Kim has pointed out, there are viruses everywhere right now in our liquid nitrogen. Uh, and yeah, so I, do they survive liquid nitrogen while they do? So, Pavlo, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that Kimball made a beautiful conclusion for for, for all this session. So, okay. uh, <laughs> the best thing we can do is just to dilute everything as yep. much dilute as we the risk. can. Yep. Dilute the risk, yeah. Yeah, yep. dilute, dilute the risk. risk. Yeah, totally agree. Um, okay, so. Lord and Kay, thank you very, very much. The panelists, thank you very much. Unfortunately, I still have about six or seven things to say, and I'll do this really, really fast. So, guys in the audience, please hang on, okay? Uh, if you want to contact us, contact at ivfmeeting.com. Contact at ivfmeeting.com. That's the first of all. Who is paying for this? We're paying for this. Uh, don't worry about it. We're not going to ask for your contribution. Uh, we will do this like Wikipedia at some point and ask if you want yeah. to give us you know, half a euro, okay, or a euro, it'll be, it'll be fine. We also look for sponsors, of course, and several of the organizations, several of the industry organizations have already offered sponsorship. So I don't think we're going to be suffering here, okay? So don't worry, don't worry about this right now. Um, we, we, uh, um, um, we're going to talk about this subject again next week. We're going to have a session that's basically a round table. So Kim is invited, Pavlo is invited. Uh, Loder is invited, K is invited, um, and um, I would think several people from the audience that we're going to invite. We're going to go through these questions and, and look for somebody, for look for people. And, and I think you raised so many relative points. You were a great audience, um, and it's a it's a pity I can't see all of you. Uh, it would be, it'd be nice to see two thousand people. Um, okay, so uh, the next session is this coming Friday, same time. You'll have to, uh, you have to register for it. Uh, and that session is called Breakthroughs in Cryo Storage Technology and the, and the three speakers. And that's a very important topic too. Of course, COVID-19 is, is so, um, so important right now that we're gonna come back to it again and again and again. And we should write this white paper and put it on the web and give it to everybody. Um, uh, so, but Breakthroughs in Cryo Storage, Cryo Storage, not just Cryo Preservation is an important topic and we'll talk about that on Friday. There will be three speakers, Peter Nash, Cynthia Hudson, and Alex Parker. They will represent three technologies that have been developed in the last few years that could help us all out making cryo storage safe um, so, so that we don't have to worry about the things we had to worry in the past, doing audits, losing samples, uh, possibly do us breaking. So I, th I think that's an important session to attend. We have two sessions already planned for next week. Could be three. Um, one session will be on artificial intelligence, which is another hot topic. Uh, and then we'll do another session like this again. And probably also uh, a session next week on follicular development in vitro. We are planning two, it may become three. And, and, uh, and, and we don't mind if we're, if we're gonna do this uh, um, several times through this difficult period and come back to 
this particular topic that Lodo and Kay have introduced in such a magnificent way. So thank you very much. I hear an enormous virtual applause. It's completely silent here, <laughs> a virtual applause. But I, I thank you both very, very, very much and the panelists and Thomas Elliott for putting this together. Um, thanks very much and, and uh, I'll see you on Friday, okay? I think I'll be moderating and hosting it on Friday. I'll then hand it over to young guys and other guys, yeah? Young guys and other guys uh, uh, from the audience, please come forward if you want to work on this effort. It's really, I think, very important that we all stay in touch. We are open to other organizations that can take over rooms and do this format in their own way, in their own language. Pavlo has already introduced Ukraine and is reaching out to Russian colleagues to, uh, um, to do this. We're looking for Asian countries. Obviously, Australia and New Zealand has to come on board, South America. Africa, Middle East, uh, please come forward. Uh, 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 Yona, I saw your name coming by, by. So if you're interested, you can do this in Hebrew, you can do this in Arabic. Um, um, this is a format for everybody. And we're just here to help you out technologically and, and also maybe about content. So thank you very much. And, and I'll- uh, Thank I'll you, thank you. On Friday. Take care. Thank you. Take care, Lodo. Yeah, thank Stay you, safe. thank Stay you. Stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.